Hello, High Five Live. I'm so excited to come to you today from the Green from the Sarah Granger Kimball home um, with one of our most anticipated and uh, well-known historians and authors from this beautiful place in Nauvoo, um, Susan Easton Black. And so excited to hear her and get to listen to her teach us about this site and other sites here and, and, and people here in Nauvoo. Um, Susan has written she says nearing 150 books now. Um, some of her newest um, are, is a, um, a new one about the other martyr with Hiram Smith. Um, the Hiram Smith story, I think. Is that right? Uh -huh. Okay. And, uh, and then a new one um, with Emma as well. And she's written many about Emma um, and obviously a lot about Nauvoo. And uh, we asked if she'd be willing to come on and she graciously accepted and is going to share a a message with us here about um, the, this site specifically, um, and then maybe just some insights about Nauvoo or Emma or anything else she wants to share with us. So, Susan, thank you, and the time is yours to, to teach us. Uh, thanks very much. I always wish that I were in Nauvoo. Uh, Nauvoo is one of my favorite places, and the little house that you're now at the Sarah Granger Kimball home was restored by the Release Society for the 140th anniversary of the Release Society on March 17th, then of 19 or 1982. So I'm I'm delighted to talk about Sarah Granger Kimball for a moment and then move on to Emma. For Sarah, she is the daughter of Oliver Granger. And Oliver Granger, much loved by the Prophet Joseph, uh, mentioned in the Doctrine and Covenants, was an agent for the Prophet uh, before the saints had moved on to Nauvoo. As Sarah came into town, uh, she is a young woman, and the man that falls in love with her and courts her is a man named Hiram Kimball. Uh, no, no relationship to Heber C. Kimball. Hiram Kimball was living in commerce, and uh, this is a replica then of the house that he had at the time. He was a very well-to-do businessman as it went in that time. He not only owned a house, he owned a store, he owned a port uh, off the Mississippi River. And for Hiram Kimball, he is not a member of the church. For Sarah, I'm sure it was a jump ball. Would, would she be faithful? I mean, she'd been through so much. Kirtland, Missouri, uh, Quincy, and now up to Nauvoo. And would she remain faithful? There's a family story told of when Sarah gives birth to a son that her husband, Hiram, uh, comes in. He's thrilled. And for young Sarah, she asks, how much do you think my son is worth, at which point her husband says, our son is worth a thousand dollars, which a thousand dollars back then, it's not quite infinity, but it's huge. And uh, she then said to her husband, how much do you think I've earned? And he, he thought perhaps she'd earned half. Now being a mother going through childbirth, I actually think she earned the whole thing, but her husband thought she had earned half. And then she said, well, then with my $500, I'd like to gift it to the building of the Nauvoo Temple. Now, her husband thought that was pretty funny. And one day as he's walking through the streets, he sees the prophet Joseph Smith, who in many respects was the competitor of Hiram Kimball there in Nauvoo. That Joseph had a home, Joseph had his red brick store, and Joseph also had a port. And as Hiram Kimball sees Joseph, he, he says to Joseph, I've got to tell you what my wife said. And uh, Joseph didn't think that it was that funny and said he would follow Hiram home and he would either take his son or he would take the $500. So what you pick up from young Sarah is that she is very faithful and that um, what, what extra money that she had, she was willing to give it 
to the building of the Nauvoo Temple and actually gave one of the largest monetary gifts to the building of that temple. Well, for, uh, for her, obviously, the story goes on. As you look around the scenery then, around the Hiram Kimball home, if you kept going uh, almost not quite straight out, there were four different quarries in Nauvoo as they built the Nauvoo Temple. And one quarry was very close to her house. And one day, uh, a close neighbor whose property actually butted up to the Hiram Kimball property, uh, Margaret Cook, was over visiting. And as Sarah and Margaret were looking out uh, the windows and could see the men going to and from the quarries, uh, they noticed their tattered shirts. Now, uh, for Joseph Smith, the building of the Nauvoo Temple uh, gave employment to many of the poor immigrants who had just arrived in Nauvoo, and it was a, a guaranteed way that they could provide for their families and get food on the table but it didn't necessarily mean that they had a wardrobe of clothes. And so uh, Sarah and Margaret, as they now looked out the window and saw what was going on, uh, they concluded that perhaps they could combine their talents and that they could make uh, some, some shirts for these men that would go down into the temple quarries to be able to uh, cut out, in some cases blast out, limestone that would be taken up to the Nauvoo Temple site. And so you get these two great women and no, notice continually how generous then this Sarah is. She goes in to her husband's general store, which was one of 38 stores in town, and she merely gets off a bolt of cloth. And then her friend, Margaret, then um, takes a cloth and makes shirts. And pretty soon, well, you, you can never have two women come up with a great idea without two others saying, hey, we could do that too, and perhaps better. So pretty soon you have financiers and you have uh, women that have the talent of being a seamstress. And finally, uh, it was Sarah's idea. She comes up with this amazing idea they already had an organization in Nauvoo for women called the Straw Hat Association. But for Sarah, she comes up with an idea that perhaps what they need was they needed to be part of a philanthropic, a um, uh, kind of benevolent society. Now, at that time in the United States, there were 26 states. And in every state, you had what were called benevolent society that were uh, women that wanted to do something to help the less fortunate in their communities. Now, in order to be recognized by headquarters, these benevolent societies, the headquarter was in Philadelphia, like uh, so many wonderful things come out of Philadelphia uh, prior to this time, but, but the benevolent society also did. And so um, Sarah concluded, well, let, let's form a chapter of this much more national and even regional at the time in Illinois. In order to do that, you needed to have a constitution and bylaws. But on March 4th of 1842, in a house that hopefully looked a lot like the reconstructed house, that Sarah now invites these kind of do-gooder women, uh, women who, who wanted to help others. And they concluded, and the day they met was March 4th. And for years and years, just decades, even during my mother's era, that we always celebrated Relief Society on March 4th because it was the very first day that these women met and concluded, let us organize. And notice it's all Sarah's pretty much her idea. She, she's into it. And uh, as the women met, they realized that in order to get official approval, that they needed to have a constitution and bylaws. Now, one woman who was not present at the time, but who had the talent to be able to write the constitution and bylaws, bylaws was a woman named Eliza R. Snow. And Eliza R. Snow, she had a regular beat in the newspapers. She wrote articles, she wrote poems. I mean, 
She's been a writer since she was a young adult. And suddenly uh, it is determined that Sarah would now talk to Eliza R. Snow, who by this point, she's the poetess of Zion. And uh, Sarah now speaks with her and asks her if she would be real willing to write up this constitution for the women who had met here in this house. Well, Eliza wrote up the constitution and before giving it to Sarah, uh, she passed it by the prophet Joseph Smith. As Joseph learned then about what some of the women in Nauvoo wanted, and they wanted to help the poor and read the constitution, he said to Eliza that, uh, that the Lord had something better for the women here in Nauvoo and that it would be an organization that would be patterned after the priesthood. So as he said that, he said, he let it be known that he wanted the women, in other words, Sarah, bring you all your friends and uh, come to his red brick store. And the date of that is March 17th. So March 17th, now we have birthdays all over the world as we celebrate Relay Society. So on March 17th, there's about 20 women that head over to Joseph Smith's red brick store. In other words, let's get out of Hiram Kimball's. Let's head to Joseph's red brick store. So uh, at these 20 women, um, they're going to not be in the store part of the building, but they're going to go upstairs. And the upstairs of the red brick store, I would call sacred space. Um, that's where Relay Society will be organized, uh, endowments are given, uh, ceilings of couples, Book of Abraham, Articles of Faith, History of the Church, it just goes on and on. And so as the women now went upstairs, they're in ages from 18 to 59, and uh, married, not married, widowed, uh, all of that. And uh, as they went up there, surprise of surprise, uh, one person that was there, that was not part of this kind of benevolent idea of society at, at uh, Sarah's house was Emma. And suddenly, uh, well, Emma, she was the first lady of Nauvoo. She was the prophet's wife and um, she's there. And now what's going to be organized is much more official. It's, it's not like the straw hat organization in town or uh, or the big field or other things that the men were involved with, you've got the prophet's wife. And as they met, there was a discussion of uh, what, what should we name this society? And um, the answer was it will be the female relief society of Nauvoo, that it's going to stand out different than all the other benevolent societies. And that when uh, there was an election of officers, only one name went forward as president. Now, with the background I've given and the backup, I think we'd all go, oh, that rightfully belongs to Sarah Granger Kimball. I mean, she was the brains behind it. She had this amazing idea. She wants to put them together. But uh, landslide election, no, nobody runs against her. It goes to Emma Smith. two women that she has lived with uh, as uh, her life has come and go, gone. And uh, she selects Sarah Cleveland, a woman that she had lived with in Quincy and knows she's incredibly compassionate. And she selects uh, Elizabeth Ann Whitney, a woman that Emma had lived with in Kirtland. And then she selects as her secretary. I mean, who else would you choose but Eliza R. Snow, I mean, the woman that you know is just going to take minutes like crazy, write everything down. Uh, not, you know, the secretary is going to make this 
presidency look amazingly great. So then we turn our attention back to Sarah. What does she do during this time period? She is a member and a member only. And uh, you'd say, of course, she's part of the kind of precursor of visiting teachers we now call ministers and uh, going around collecting poor, uh, collecting clothes and different items for the poor. But um, I, I wanted to, to follow through on Sarah. She eventually will go west. And um, as before she goes west, her husband will be baptized. And uh, I think it had a lot to do with her example, actually. And um, she, she will take her family west. And she does become a Relief Society president in the Salt Lake 15th Ward. And at one point when Martin Harris, a witness to the Book of Mormon, he's well into his 80s, he's made it out to Utah, and he speaks in her ward. And at this point, uh, it's obvious to everyone that Martin doesn't have any teeth. And Sarah now goes up to him. She has the, I don't know, a stash of money that she's collected from the women. And she says uh, to Martin that, that the women of her release society would agree and that she would like to be able to purchase him a full set of teeth. And uh, Martin's comment was, no, I, I want you to give it to the poor. Now, um, Sarah will never become what you'd say, um, <laughs> you know, the General Relay Society president. Uh, her name will not go up in neon lights and basically did not until uh, in 1882, when the Relief Society had enough funds to be able to reconstruct that beautiful little house that you're seeing. Why do I like Sarah? I think that many of us, as life has come and gone, that sometimes we've come up with a great idea and made plans and, and uh, thought for sure uh, we, we were next up, we, we would be chosen whether it was primary present or release society or whatever it might be, and yet um, have felt at times perhaps overlooked. And I think for her, she, um, well, you know, her, her reward for sure in heaven. And perhaps uh, in our momentary pause in our day to remember some somebody wonderful. Now, if you were to say, how do I feel about Relay Society? And uh, the fact that Emma became the president, how absolutely wonderful that uh, the Lord would choose the wife of a prophet, even the prophet Joseph Smith, to lead out as the president of Relay Society, the very first one in this dispensation. I, uh, I am a product of Relay Society. Uh, I think I am a fifth generation having been a Relay Society president. It's in my bones. But why do I love Relay Society? I, I love the sisterhood of it because at one point in my life, I had a marvelous visiting teacher uh, who was willing to watch my children when I was a single parent so that I could go back to school and uh, to be able to, uh, I don't know, perhaps be the woman I was meant to be, but uh, a chance to further my education. I will be forever grateful for Relief Society and for um, literally an unsung hero, uh, Sarah Granger Kimball for one, having an incredible idea that she wants to help the poor, but perhaps even more than that, organizing women, trying to make it happen. But when it came time to take the leadership role, when she was not chosen, she was, um, I don't know, she was there at meetings. She was willing to continue to help the poor. And as the decades came and went, she continued to help the poor uh, many uh, hundreds and hundreds of miles away from Nauvoo. I'd like to close with my testimony. I know that Joseph Smith was a great prophet, 
I am forever grateful to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I am forever grateful to, um, to uh, actually love Nauvoo and uh, to be able to feel like my roots go there. And it isn't just my roots, it's my heart. And I say this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Sorry, Susan, I hit the wrong button there, but uh, thank you so much for for those words. It's after a, a thought like yours that you just shared that I fall in love with a site like this and and uh, will now hold this site just sacred. And and uh, honestly, I, I knew about it. I knew some of those stories, but uh, hadn't felt the the testimony of it until that presentation. And And hopefully those, although like you, uh, our audience can't be here today and, and to be in this beautiful setting of Nauvoo. I know that that spirit was felt wherever they were. So thank you so much and, and uh, appreciate all that you've done in your life to, to be able to know and understand and teach in the way that you just did. So thank you all and, and appreciate it and Susan joining us. So thank you. Have a great trip. Thanks. Okay, goodbye.